It's standing room only at the uh, Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom tonight. It's great to see you all, folks. Trigger warning. You have entered a safe space for academic and intellectual freedom. In other words, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gabriel Noah Brahm, director of the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for a very special event, an evening with Patrick Deneen, author of The Intellectual Blockbuster, Why Liberalism Failed. To promote dialogue, Professor Deneen's lecture will be followed by a brief critical response from another esteemed guest here for the occasion, Prof Professor Jesse Kaufman, chair of the history section at Eastern uh, Michigan University and author of two recent books on World War I, published by Harvard University Press. Jesse received his BA in history from UCLA and his MA and PhD from Stanford. He served four years on active duty in the US military in the 1990s, and he is the faculty advisor of Catholics on campus at EMU. Before we begin our main event, I thought you might like to know a few things about the center itself. We're now in our second full year of operations. Our website is up recently. In case there's anyone who hasn't seen it yet, please take a look. And if you click on the contacts tab and send us your contact information, we'll put you on our mailing list. We have podcasts, op-eds, videotaped lectures, and interviews with leading thinkers on the website. Plans for next year include a visit to the center by famed libertarian economist Deirdre McCloskey. On October 23rd and 24th, she'll be speaking about the benefits of capitalism. Mark your calendars and watch for announcements about that. Moreover, in case you're interested in our broader purposes, tonight's speaker is the second in a series of lectures and seminars for faculty, students, administration, staff, and the community at large that we call Safe Space for Open Inquiry. Uh, the idea of this initiative is to provide intellectual and moral space for rigorous investigation of humanly meaningful questions, regardless of political pressure from any direction. And without succumbing to the pressure to treat college students as more fragile than they are, or faculty for that matter. Without, uh, sorry, with that in mind, the third speaker this year in the Safe Space for Open Inquiry series this year is Greg Lukianoff. And uh, you may recognize that name. Greg is co-author with Jonathan Haidt of the best-selling book, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Lukianoff will be on campus April 22nd. Mark your calendar. He'll be meeting with students, faculty, administration, staff, and presenting a lecture. I hope to see you all at that event. I'm sending around a sign-up list if you prefer to sign up uh, on our email list the old-fashioned way. Uh, otherwise, um, please contact us via the uh, website. I'll send this around momentarily. In sum, at the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom, we promote viewpoint diversity and free speech on campus, and that includes both liberal and conservative voices, voices often absent or beleaguered on the American campus in recent decades. Thus, we have a special interest in promoting thoughtful reflection on classical liberalism and the great books of Western civilization, not merely as targets for those interested in deconstructing patriarchy, but as resources and inspiration for a renewed liberal education in the 21st century. As of Two weeks ago, this is how I spent my semester break, the center is affiliated with the FAR, or Fund for Academic Renewal in Washington, DC, as well as the ACTA, American Council of Trustees and Alumni. We are grateful for their support and proud to have been named recently the 68th member of the ACTA's Oasis of Excellence 
Network. Tonight's excellent oasis of conservatism is made possible by a generous grant from the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University. My thanks to our friends at the IHS. Thanks also to the Center's Board of Directors, some of whom are here tonight, our undergraduate and graduate student fellows, likewise in attendance, and a heartfelt thanks to all of you for supporting Open Inquiry by showing up. This is not a workshop, so your attendance is not at all interpreted as agreement with what you are about to hear. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. That's up to you. There are no thought police here tonight. Instead, there will be time for questions, robust civil dialogue, and even, should you feel so moved, thoughtful dissent and polite disagreement, if that's your thing after the lecture by our distinguished guest. Please hold your dissent to the end, is all we ask. And who knows, you might find yourself uh, persuaded. That, too, is an option. Thanks also to the College Republicans and College Democrats for co-sponsoring tonight's event in a rare show of bipartisanship these days. Last but not least, most of all, I want to personally thank my research assistant, Timothy Eggert. Uh, my podcast co-host, my Sancho Panza, if you will, uh, Without Tim's hard work and dedication, I can't imagine how the center would function. Whatever we've managed to achieve this year, it is thanks to a partnership of which he is fully half. His love of the life of the mind for its own sake is emblematic of what the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom means to encourage, and which I think of as symbolized by the flame that burns atop the flying uh, torch logo, the center's iconic uh, logo, which Tim, I know, loves uh, so well, having helped uh, in the process. To introduce uh, tonight's uh, featured speaker, I now turn it over to someone who needs no introduction on this campus. As you know, Robert Wynn is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Wynn received his BS and MS degrees from Idaho State University and MS and PhD degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he is the co-founder and CEO of the Upper Michigan Brain Tumor Center. Tim and I are most grateful indeed for Rob's support of the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom in its infancy. And it is an honor and sincere pleasure to have him address you now. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, Patrick J. Deneen is professor and David A. Potenzani Memorial College Chair in the Department of Political Science at Notre Dame University. He holds a BA in English Literature and a PhD in Political Science from Rutgers University. His dissertation, The Odyssey of Political Theory, was awarded the American Political Science Association's Leo Strauss Award for Best Dissertation in Political Theory in 1995. Following the completion of his PhD, Dr. Deneen worked as a speechwriter and special advisor to the director for the United States Information Agency. He then moved to Princeton University as an assistant professor of government and was there from 1997 to 2005. Following his time at Princeton, Professor Deneen was named the Zach Polos Kunalakis, Associate Professor of Government at Georgetown University, where he worked until the fall of 2012 when he took his current position on the faculty at Notre Dame. He is the editor and author of seven books, numerous articles and reviews, and has delivered invited lectures around the country and around the world. Additionally, he has been awarded research fellowships from Princeton University and the Earhart Foundation. His published works include The Odyssey of Political Theory, which was awarded an honorable mention for the APSA's Best First Book Award in 2000, Democratic Faith, Conserving America, Essays on Present Discontents, 
and most recently, Why Liberalism Failed. This latest book is a rare work, a work of scholarship that sells a lot of copies and is read and discussed broadly both inside and outside the academy. Indeed, I'm delighted to say I'm among those who've had the pleasure of reading the book and it strikes me in its call for a renewed understanding of the importance of community in all of our lives. I am pleased to see that the students and the faculty at Northern care about these thought-provoking questions the book raises concerning liberalism and individualism as challenges for today. So please now join me in welcoming Dr. Patrick Deneen to Northern Michigan University and the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom. Dr. Deneen. Thank you so very much, um, Dean Nguyen, for that introduction. Uh, I, I'm so impressed by my credentials that I don't recognize myself. <laughs> Uh, and thank you also to the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom uh, and Professor Gabriel Brahm. I also want to thank um, and acknowledge uh, Professor Allen, where is he? Uh, right over here, uh, who uh, uh, I knew him before he was gray. Uh, he, was a gra he was a graduate student at Princeton before I was gray. Uh, I was a very young professor. He was a very old graduate student, so we were... Uh, I can admit now that he intimidated the heck out of me then, so... <laughs> Which, which happens when you're a new professor. So, um, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I haven't been to this part of Michigan uh, yet, and it is a part that having flown in over uh, this beautiful uh, area, I, I plan to come back to with my fishing pole. Uh, I live in a part of Indiana that's called Michiana, so I'm wondering, do you call this Michiana, Michiana, or Canigan? Uh, it's, uh, but it's a beautiful area, and I'm grateful to be here with you today. And I understand this is an unusually beautiful day, so thank you for being in this uh, neon-lit room. So I want to I talk, I try to talk for um, uh, about 45 minutes, uh, hopefully uh, no, no more than that, maybe a bit less than that, to touch on some of the themes of, of my book, Why Liberalism Failed, and to try to summarize some of those themes. So let me begin with, with, with a definition. What do I mean by liberalism? And there are some of you doubtless, and perhaps with that introduction, that are a little bit combative that are expecting me to say it's, it's all of you progressives that are to blame for America's demise. Uh, I really mean this to be a blanket condemnation in a sense of sort of everybody in the room, more or less, uh, which is uh, the liberal political philosophy that we've all grown up in, and in many ways shapes our, our, our self-understanding. I often um, invoke the image that was used uh, by David Foster Wallace in his remarkable and wonderful uh, graduation address that he gave at Kenyon College uh, shortly before his tragic death, uh, in which he, uh, the title of that lecture is called This is Water. If you don't know it, it's really a wonderful um, reflection on the meaning of life. And he begins that lecture with a kind of an old story about two young fish that are swimming around a fishbowl. Uh, and they cross paths with, a, with an older fish, and the older fish nods or winks his fin uh, and says, uh, how are you doing, young man? And they said, we're fine, sir. And then he says, uh, isn't the water really nice today? And the young fish nod, and they go swimming by, and then one of the young fish turns to the other young fish and says, what the heck is water? Well, our water is liberalism. Our water is a political system uh, and a social and economic order that sprung from the minds of thinkers long before we were born, that we can still study on paper, who didn't live in a liberal world, who were imagining a different world than the world they lived in. And part of their hope, I think, and part of their intention was to create a world in which people could live the lives that they wanted to live, free of the arbitrary authority uh, of the type that existed at that time, the arbitrary authority of kings, and aristocrats, lords and earls and dukes, of masters over slaves, of people who lacked freedom in a world in which freedom was in short supply. And as a theory, in many ways, it was a very noble theory, but also very early on, some thinkers recognized that it had a kind of trajectory that was dangerous. It had a trajectory uh, that would orient in a direction that in some ways resulted in the opposite of what it might intend to be, that rather than creating a world of liberty might create a kind of world 
uh, where we would lack liberty. And that's the paradox that I want to talk about today. Uh, the theme or, or the thesis of my book is that liberalism failed, uh, not because it, it failed to live up to its ideals, but in some senses because it succeeded. It became fully itself. It gave us so much liberty. Uh, we're so free, in a sense, uh, that we lack the freedom that, in theory, we all would wish to possess. One of the earliest uh, voices that warned of this internal paradox of liberalism was the great French author Alexis de Tocqueville. And I, I can't uh, go five minutes into a lecture without invoking Tocqueville's name. It's in, it's in my contract, so I have to invoke him. This is from uh, the second uh, volume, uh, part two, chapter one of Democracy in America. This is a chapter that conservatives love. It's uh, the chapter entitled, Why Democrats will love equality, love, love equality more than they will love uh, liberty, uh, that they will embrace equality more than liberty. But Tocqueville, in addition to saying that there will be a tendency among Democrats to desire equality even at the cost of liberty, that they will require that everyone be equal even if everyone ceases to be free, he says that in fact there is a kind of deeper telos within liberal democracy. And that telos is, he suggests, uh, the complete form of that equality can take, which he calls a kind of equal liberty. Right? It can be imagined as an extreme point at which freedom and equality touch each other and intermingle. It's actually the combination of freedom and equality. Freedom from each other and equality in that condition of freedom. Then with none differing like, the, like them, no one will be able to exercise a tyrannical power. Men will be perfectly free because they will be entirely equal, and they will be perfectly equal because they will be entirely free. This is the ideal to which a democratic peoples tend. This is, in some ways, you could say what Tocqueville regards as what I call you the telos of liberal democracy, its final end, that to which it uh, seeks or, in, or inclines. Now again, as I began by saying, Tocqueville intuits this. He, he sees this and even prophesizes this outcome in a world in which this is not visible. Right? It's a very prophetic vision that he has. Much of Tocqueville is very prophetic. It's very remarkably uh, um, astute in its understanding of the internal dynamics of liberal democracy. In fact, Tocqueville lived in a world, was raised in a world in which you could say the opposite was the case. It was a world in which there was not equal liberty. There was not equality as such, and there was not liberty as such. We can just begin by looking at his name, de Tocqueville. Those of you with a little bit of French will recognize that this is an indication that Tocqueville was well-born. He came from a place and came from a people. His name, like my name, Denin, indicates that he was a member of the nobility. I, of the, of the royal house of Nin, of course, that famous family. Tocqueville, who could trace his lineage back uh, to, uh, uh, to an ancestor who fought along with William the Conqueror at the Battle of Hastings. So for centuries, his family owned this nice building in the west, uh, the, the west coast of, uh, of France, in Normandy. Those of you who might have the chance to get out to Normandy this summer, perhaps to visit the beaches during the 75th anniversary of the American landing, the Allied uh, landing uh, at Normandy, can actually book a room in this building for only roughly $4,000 a night. So if you come from a family with the first letters DE, you might be able to afford this house. What his name, de Tocqueville, indicates is that he was from a place and from a people. De Tocqueville, the word de here meaning of, like so many of the names of the nobility, defined somebody by who or where you were from. You were of a place or you were of a people. Who you were was, in a sense, given to you as a matter of birthright. The name uh, indi indicating. Uh, who you, uh, what your identity was. If you know some German, you know that the, the, the version, the German version of this would be V-O-N, Van, or the Danish, Dutch version of this would be V-A-N, Van. And most languages have some version of this. This is, of course, a kind of, you could say, this is a, a theme that we see in simply um, demonstrated in the ways in which we would designate ourselves through something so simple as our names. Think of the great 
names, the kind of classic names of the of the old wasp aristocracy in England and in America. Now these names interestingly indicated what you did. Right? Think of that, that classic, that once common name, Smith, right? indicating what you would be doing for a living. Right? It's like that old Jerry Seinfeld joke. If you give your child the name Jeeves, you've pretty much set them on the course for life. You know? <laughs> Uh, if your name was Smith, it wasn't just a random last name. It indicated what you would be doing. You would be a Smith. This is what, uh, this is what your career would be. And so many of these classic, aristoc uh, classic names of the aristocratic age, even if you weren't a member of the aristocracy, even if your name didn't start with D-E, these names were indicators even among the working class that your identity was given. Who you were was defined by who you were from. If you were the child of Taylor, you would be a Taylor. If, you were, if your last name was Weaver, another common last name, you would be uh, uh, putting threads and wool together. Uh, if you were born to a Cooper, this is a, now a long lost art, but being refound by great bourbon makers in America, uh, you would be making barrels. Right? Everyone has to have barrel and uh, bourbon infused uh, beer and et cetera. Coopers are again very important. Now, when I give these examples at the University of Notre Dame, my students look at me with strange glares. Like, what are you talking about? Names like Smith and Weaver and Taylor, we've never heard of these. But then I give them this example. How about a name like O'Leary or McClanahan? Uh, and then suddenly everyone in the room says, oh, my name starts with an O. Everyone in the room starts, you know, raises their hand, all these Irish Catholics that we have uh, at Notre Dame. Here again, even among the working class in an aristocratic age, your name was an indicator of who you were from, from. In this case, literally of, right? This, this is an abbreviation of the word of, of Leary. This is Mrs. O'Leary who, whose cow knocked over a lamp and burned down the city of Chicago, if you know that old story. And so many of the names, uh, again, we can think about um, from a kind of aristocratic ethos. Think of, uh, again, the MC, the, the, the Scottish version of this, or MAC, meaning the son of. Or think of the Swedish names, Johansson or Johnson, um, all indicating that you were the son of such a person. Or if you were really hardcore Swedish and you were the, the, the daughter of someone, your last name wouldn't be Johnson, it'd be John's, John's daughter. Uh, your, your name would be literally, I am the daughter of John. What all of these are in some ways are indicators that who you were, your identity was the result of who and where you were from. This is the world in which liberalism was born as an idea, but didn't exist in fact. It was an attempt to redefine the terms on which we understood ourselves, the effort to persuade us that we weren't defined by who or where we were from, what tradition we happened to be born to, what religion you were born to, what place you happened to be born into, that in fact these things were in some ways irrelevant to who we understood ourselves to be. Now again, to imagine this as a philosophy in an age in which this was not a fact, in which your name literally defined who you were, was you know, a kind of brave and even extraordinary set of claims. And yet you could say it had this powerful impact in reshaping and redefining the world in which we lived, in which our last names are largely random accumulation of letters that in a sense mean nothing. Like, you know, we, we like to play you know, the etymology game. What does your last name mean? But we do so in some ways to in some ways reveal that these don't fundamentally reveal who we are, that they don't fundamentally define who we are. What happened? What, what occurred that transformed an age in which who we were was defined by who and where we came from to one in which those aspects of our lives are largely coincidental and can be rendered largely irrelevant? Well, here we can look to a number of thinkers and figures, but I'll focus on the figure who Wikipedia describes as the, as the father of liberalism. And if it's in Wikipedia, you know it's true. Most of you students here should be always quoting Wikipedia because your professors will love it and they'll give you, they'll give you A's. Locke is described as the father of liberalism and sometimes he's described as America's philosopher. 
certainly the case that Thomas Jefferson was reading Locke as he wrote his draft of the Declaration of Independence. It's one of the greatest acts of plagiarism ever in, a, in, in the history of the world. Or if not plagiarism, one of the greatest little summaries of Locke's argument. Right? Locke, in his second treatise of government, argues that we, can, we, we need in some ways to, uh, to begin with a new conception of human beings, not understanding ourselves as defined by who or where or what tradition we're born into, but understanding ourselves as creatures who in our natural condition are defined by none of those things. Right? Imagining something he calls the state of nature in which all of those what he regarded as accidents of our birth are stripped away, in which in a sense we know nothing of who we are by dint of where we come from or who we come from, or the tradition we're born into. Imagine human beings in the state of nature, he says, and all of that disappears. We're simply creatures that know certain things about ourselves. We desire certain things. We seek out certain goods of life. We probably act on the impulses of self-interest, the desire to satisfy our desires. This is a dangerous desire and probably will lead us into conflict with others. So in this condition, we would establish some form of government on the basis of what he calls a social contract, one in which we would agree to respect each other's differences under this social contract, to preserve the rights that we enjoy in the state of nature, the rights especially he describes of life, liberty, and property. Yeah, Jefferson fudged that one a little bit. Pursuit of happiness sounded nice, had a nice ring to it. All right. But in which government comes into being to protect these rights of life, liberty, property, pursuit of happiness, and no more. Gives us, in some ways, the freedom to pursue these various pursuits of life without dictating the kind of life we ought to lead, of creating a society in which we can pursue the goods of our lives. In such a conception, then, who we are is in many ways the result of the accumulation of our individual choices. And in some ways, you could say that image of the natural human being, the naturally free human being, becomes a kind of normative guide for how we should think about how we make those choices. Now, in the first instance, it's a very important normative guide for how we determine whether a government is legitimate. And this is exactly the reason that Jefferson found Locke so valuable at the time that America was considering breaking away from England. Right? The king was, was usurping the rights of then British citizens and soon to be American citizens. And so based upon the principle of the consent of the governed, right, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men and derive their powers, their just powers, from the consent of the governed. There will be a test on this at the end of the, right? You have to memorize this if you're a political science professor. That is, a, in core, a summary of John Locke's argument in the Second Treatise of Government. Government comes into being to secure the rights of individuals. But of course, what Locke understood, and of course the American founders understood, is that consent of this type could only thought to be legitimate if it extended not simply to government, but to all aspects of our lives. How could we be truly thought to make a free choice as a citizen in regard to our government if we were in some ways deeply and profoundly influenced by the other parts of our lives, our families, our communities, our religions? How could we be thought to be truly free people in deciding whether our government was legitimate if we weren't in a sense free from these other influences that might shape our choices, that might illegitimately shape our choices? that might lead us to consent to a government that didn't protect our rights. And so Locke understood that in, in addition to the political argument, there needed to be a social and even a private aspect to the argument that he made. Right. Locke begins with an understanding, as I just suggested, with an understanding of freedom, and this is uh, his description from the Second Treatise of Government, that in the State of nature, it is a state of perfect freedom, the liberty of persons to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and their persons as they see fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. And in this condition, they are perfectly free and perfectly equal. It's exactly that telos 
that Tocqueville describes as that which liberal democracy goes toward. This is what Locke argues is what we begin with, not what we end with, what we begin with, in theory at least. This idea of freedom implies many other ideas of freedom that Locke elucidates. This is actually Jefferson, but Locke uh, articulates it as well. This is when Jefferson is in his high Lockean phase. In his tune-up pamphlet uh, to the Declaration of Independence, he describes the way in which uh, one has a natural right of leaving one's place, right? of departing from one's country in which chance and not choice has placed a person. Right? One of the fundamental understandings of the liberal human being is that where we come from is a matter of chance. Right? For de Tocqueville, it's his name. Right? How does he get away from that? It's who he is. That chateau is, like, that's where his entire, his entire family is buried there. How do you get away from that? That's in some ways deeply who you are. Right? For a liberal human being, we could say where we're from is a matter of chance. And indeed, one of the aspects that we think about as deeply and profoundly and a core aspect of our liberty is the ability to get out of Dodge. Right? Where would the American cinema industry be without getting out of Dodge? Right? That's the whole premise of the Western, getting out. Right? Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a Little House in the Prairie. Whenever Pa uh, Ingalls saw the smoke in the distance, he knew it was time to leave. And Ma Ingalls would roll her eyes and say, OK, Charles will leave. Freedom to move about the world is a core freedom. Further, we need to also rethink, Locke argues, the way in which we understand the very form of a kind of inheritance that we receive. Right? You're raised by a particular family in a particular place with a particular set of beliefs, and they seek to pass those beliefs on. In the world in which Locke lived, religious beliefs, one's traditions, one's culture, that was who you were. That was constitutive of your identity. And yet here Locke, now in the letter concerning toleration, his great work about religious toleration, argues that these are really just voluntary societies. These are nothing more than organizations that people enter and can exit simply as a matter of choice, of preference. Right? Now again, he's describing this in a time in which people are killing each other over these beliefs. This so deeply defines who you are that to re-describe this as basically a kind of club is a kind of extraordinary philosophical revolution. It must have seemed to his readers as if he was coming from another planet. And yet, as I'll suggest in a few minutes, it tends to describe increasingly the world in which we live, in which these are clubs, which you enter and you leave with relative ease. And religion, uh, he suggests, is just like this kind of club. Right? If it was something more than that, he says, then the religion of parents would descend upon children as the same right as inheritance of the, as their temporal estates. Now, for him to say that religion right, can't be anything other than a voluntary club because otherwise it would be like an inheritance. Again, that's a kind of extraordinary claim in a time in which your religion was exactly that. Right? Was exactly that. It was defining of who you were. Right? To leave your religion would be to leave your identity in a sense. So Locke, on, Locke is in some ways imagining a world, right? not describing a world, but imagining a world in which this might be the place, might, might be the case. When we think about the ways in which our identities are shaped, what informs us, and maybe in some ways what shapes us in ways we can't ultimately choose, we can't make the result of our, of our voluntary agreement, our voluntary choice, the relationship, of course, that comes first to mind is our family, right? The first, those first relationships you have, right? Those, uh, those defining relationships between parents and children. Think of how much your life, your life path, your thought, your belief system, who you are is defined by those first relationships. The very language you speak, the way in which you understand the world, the street you grew up in, the friends you happen to have, the language that you speak and that has shaped your minds because of you know, firing certain synapses as opposed to others. All of this was not the result of choice. And yet what Locke understands is that unless we're in some ways capable of understanding our relationship to our families on the same terms as the, human, as the free human in the state of nature, we can't be thought to be truly free. Now, 
there's a very sort of adolescent version of this. It's sort of like the five-year-old who realizes that he hates his parents. And those of you with children or those of you who remember your childhood, remember that day when you said to your parents, I wish I'd never been born to you. A very memorable day in my life, both as a child and as a parent, especially as a parent. But what Locke is in part arguing is that unless you are, in a sense, capable of freeing yourself, if not truly, like not severing your ties, but freeing yourself conceptually from the defining influence of family, you can't be thought to be truly free. And thus, in an important chapter called Of Parental Power, dealing exactly with this question, he suggests that there comes a point in every child's life where every man's children, being by nature as free as himself or any of his ancestors ever were, may, whilst they are in that freedom, choose what society may, they may join themselves to, what commonwealths they may, may, they may put themselves under. In other words, all of you, whether you realized it or not, at some point in your lives, presumably if you're older than 16, maybe 18 years old, you are in the state of nature at some point. You may not have realized it. And at that point, you decided, and am I going to stay in the relationship with my parents on the terms in which they might want me to stay? Now, you might stay in that relationship. But what it does is it defaults that relationship to one of choice, not one of inheritance. It defaults that relationship to one that you choose. Even if you chose to stay in the religion, in the town, in the tradition, in the culture, it was a matter of choice. Notice the conceptual change that takes place. It might be describing the same exact phenomenon. Right? Somebody growing up, staying in the town, staying in the religion, staying in the culture. But you've done so because you were, at least for a moment, in the state of nature. Every one of us gets that moment in the state of nature in which we define our lives. Now, again, I want to stress what Locke insists is that this is something he's describing rather, I'm sorry, something he's imagining rather than describing in the world. And yet what I want to suggest here tonight is that this imagining of a kind of world conceived by figures like Locke and other liberal thinkers is exactly the world that we've created. It's taken a long time. It's taken hundreds of years. It's taken enormous efforts, efforts of politics, efforts of society, efforts of economics, and yet it has transformed the world, it has made the world that we live in. It is the water in which we swim and that we take for granted. The fact, I, I will tell my students at Notre Dame, I said, it would be seen as a failure of your education if you were to return home, unless you're from one of five cities in America, which you might return to. And I had a student at Georgetown raise his hand and say, what are the other two cities? Think now, in some ways, I can talk about this symbolically. Oh, oh, I'm going to skip this. Think of the last names that we, that we have today. We still have Weavers. This is uh, somebody that you don't know. This is Dennis Weaver, who was an ac actor uh, in a show called Gunsmoke. Here's an actor you do know. He does not make barrels. He makes stars. Right, Bradley Cooper. Now here's a tailor. I like this one because she's wearing Notre Dame swag. Her brother went to Notre Dame. I had him in a class. I didn't even realize that he was that swift. Uh, this, what I really like about this, uh, about this tailor is that what used to be a last name that defined who you were now is a first name. It's the name that's given. It's the arbitrary name. Right? Notice how many of what used to be the last names that defined you have become first names. Like every friend of my son growing up was named Cooper. Not Bradley Cooper, but Cooper Bradley was the <laughs> typical name. Right. The, this transformation of our world, from a world in which your name defined you to which a world is to, to which, which your name, your identity is made by you, is not strikingly uh, a world in which individuals are found in the state of nature. It's the consequence of a realization of a liberal regime of a liberal political, social, economic order. And it has one that has come into existence over time. Now, if I had more time, I would spend some time telling you and giving you and describing about all the ways that, among other things, today's contemporary social science data shows how we have become more individual over time. This is one of the stunning things about social science uh, data, which I generally I find to be completely 
uh, irrelevant and, and you know, proving the obvious. But one of the most interesting things in my field in political science and in sociology is that there's consistent studies that show that over time, by every measure that we can, that we can imagine, connectivity of people to people has declined. Right? We can think about it in a variety of ways. Right. We have uh, something that Robert Putnam wrote about some 10, 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago now, probably more than that, uh, is that we have freed ourselves from associations, groups, clubs, memberships. It's not just that we're free to join whatever we want. We have liberated ourselves from membership. We have become more individual. Uh, in the famous article that uh, Putnam published about this phenomenon, he described the fact that, according to his data, as many people were bowling in 1995, or when he did this study, as were bowling 30, 40 years ago. But the number of people who were bowling in bowling leagues had declined precipitously. People were bowling alone. We are, every piece of data shows that we are liberating ourselves from religion. We're changing religion. Uh, my, my colleague David Campbell, along with Robert Putnam, has shown that your religion today, if you have a religion, it's likely that it would either be the religion you chose or you happen to be in that, that conform to your political beliefs. So your religion is likely to be, is to follow your political ideology today rather than potentially correcting it. Uh, it, is, it is to be uh, chosen by preference of politics. Right. Lots of studies, uh, re very recent studies, show that we are less likely to be married than ever. Uh, and those who are married um, are still as likely uh, to divorce as to remain married, roughly 50%. Uh, higher if you're from uh, economically straightened circumstances. Again, some recent findings suggest that we are becoming an increasingly childless society. We freed ourselves from the next generation. And those who do have children are likely only to have one child. And so you're freed from the experience of having a sibling. You'll be alone in your home, in your generation. You won't have the experience of having a brother or a sister. The ancient ideals of fraternity and sorority, they're not just clubs you join on college campuses. They're named for the experience of having a relative in your generation. This is also decreasing. One of the more poignant statistics that I've come across is that from roughly the 1980s until today, the number of people who describe themselves as having a close friend uh, or the, the, num the number of close friends that people describe themselves as having has dropped from three to one. Now, really close friends, people you can call up at 2 a.m. and say, you know, my girlfriend just broke up with me. Can I come over and commiserate? Like, that's a close friend. Like, you know, you know get out the burb and it's 3 a.m. I, I know you're asleep. Uh, if that's only one person, they're not going to remain your friend for a long time. If it's three, you can sort of spread out the pain. Right. That decrease is really significant in terms of the likelihood of us having deep, ongoing relationships. Right. Some recent studies suggest, uh, this was just an article that was published last year in uh, the National Review, the rise of what was called lonely America. 40% Americans of Americans now describe themselves as most often lonely, as opposed to feeling like they're in connection with others. Now these are, these are I can show you charts and graphs. I, I have those actually uh, somewhere in this, uh, in this uh, uh, slideshow, but I won't, uh, I won't uh, assail your senses with these. What is striking about this is that in all of these cases, these statistics aren't just random. They take place in a kind of, they, you see the increasing disconnection of people consistently over time and over generations. We have become more liberal. We have become more free, more individual over time. We have become, we have attained ever more fully that telos of liberal democracy that Tocqueville described us as tending toward. So let me get to the, the crux of my argument, why liberalism failed. Let me try to do this fairly quickly. First, it failed in some ways, I think, because what many of us have experienced, and I think we are seeing this in our political system, is that the tools that were required to make us free turns out that they are massive and dominating. Human beings are not, in fact, by nature, free and equal. We are, in fact, bound and unequal. Right? We're bound to each other. We're certainly bound in obligation, and we should be bound in gratitude to parents. We're not equal to our parents. We're not equal to our children. It's rare you're going to be in a relationship that you're simply equal. Those of you with a boyfriend or girlfriend, you know this. right? 
Jerry Seinfeld had an episode, who has the hand in the relationship, right? Who's got the upper hand? We know this is the case. And yet we seek to make a world in which everything and everyone is equal. In order to do this, you need a massive architecture. And that architecture takes two forms. We need as much as possible to depersonalize our relationships. To make depersonal or impersonal the relationships that might once have required interpersonal bonds and obligations. Think of the Amish, for example. The Amish don't allow members of their community to get insurance because they're really mean. No, actually, that's really great. Wouldn't it be great not to have insurance? The reason for this is that by taking insurance, the Amish believe, you actually damage the community. That if something bad happens to you in the course of your life, it should be the responsibility of the community to make you whole. If your house burns down, the community will come out and build you a new house. But that takes a lot of time out of your Saturdays, as we all know, having to go build somebody's house down the street. Right? If somebody dies, a parent dies, the community will help raise the children in that family. It's an, it's an extraordinary sense of mutual obligation in such communities. We've just had this extraordinary debate in our country over insurance, health insurance. Of course, it's very complicated, and I don't want to suggest it's simple. But the terms of the debate were, should the state provide insurance or should the market provide insurance? And these are the two impersonal forces that we tend toward. Now, in the case of the state, we need the state in many ways to cr help create individuals. One way it does this, uh, we, we saw this uh, recently in the re-election of President Obama in a, um, oops, uh, in a, in a series, in a, in a campaign ad, is to provide us various programs that allow us to live lives in which we no longer have to rely upon other people. So I don't know if, if any of you saw this campaign ad uh, that uh, uh, was, was an online campaign ad that President Obama um, uh, aired for a while at least. It's difficult to find it online anymore, but it was described what he called the life of Julia, the life of a young woman whose entire life was successful because of a series of government programs in which in her life, at least as portrayed in the slideshow, no other human being ever appears, except very briefly a child who's taken away on a bus and never seen again. It's very tragic. Right. This, uh, this was a case in which uh, um, providing uh, particularly um, uh, contraceptives would be a way in which Julia would no longer have to rely upon anyone or anything to be free and equal, right? Isn't that the ideal form of freedom and equality, right? Not to have to rely on anyone to be completely free and completely equal, right? right? Not mentioned here was the HHS mandate in which you were going to force nuns to provide contraception. The government will enforce the forms of equal liberty in order that everyone can be free and equal. And what's interesting about this is that we've lived through a long period of time in which we've come to believe that there is a deep antipathy between individualism and the state. And yet what I think this um, unfolding of this uh, realization of individual li liberty reveals is that there's in fact a deep connection between a growing state that provides for the impersonal forces that allow us to be free of other people uh, and growing condition of individualism. And it shouldn't shock us that a society that is the most individualistic is also a society that is experiencing the greatest growth of government ever in the history of the world. Right? King George III would have been jealous of a state like ours. Right? We thought that George, George's state was oppressive. Right? What would, what would uh, Jefferson think about ours? But then there are those, and certainly it's the case, that the global market is the preferred impersonal mechanism by which we achieve a kind of freedom from others. The market does not have to be, in a sense, depersonalized. Right? My favorite example of the depersonalized market is that famous scene of It's a Wonderful Life, when George Bailey persuades the entire town of Bedford Falls not to withdraw all of their money from the bank. You know the scene, right? He said, your, your money's in her house and his money's in her house, right? And he persuades them that, in fact, the market is deeply personal. And if you withdraw all your money, you'll damage the community, right? That was a great moment of a very personal market working, right? But it required people to know each other and to have some sense that we got to be in this thing together. Think of what happened in 2008 when the economy cratered and most of your families lost a lot of their money, right? That was a very depersonalized mortgage market that cratered. People didn't know who they were lending to. In fact, they'd lend to anybody that came into the door. And then they sold those mortgages out of town, often to international markets, where it didn't matter to them 
whether or not those mortgages were any good. A completely depersonalized market makes us free, but in some ways you could say has this profound effect of shaping us, of helping make us into individuals. There's another famous social science experiment in which students were tested on their likelihood of feelings of altruism, their sense of altruism. They tested a bunch of students, like many of you here in the room, how altruistic are you? And they tested them when they came into college, and then they tested the same students after they had taken Economics 101. And guess what happened? They ceased being as altruistic. They actually became much more self-interested. Right? A market economy premised on the idea that an economy is about the maximizing of my utility is going to make you more individualistic, thinking, thinking about my advantage as opposed to your advantage. It's not that these disciplines describe who we are, they help make us who we are. And just in this way, the market does so as well. And what I want to suggest is that these two forces aren't opposed again, but they work in many ways in concert. And I could give you many examples of this, but one would be uh, how the market and the state have combined in part to create the living circumstances we find ourselves in today. Many of us probably grew up in suburbs. And suburbs are, you know, it's the, it's the most extraordinary invention in the history of the world to make people completely deracinated, atomized human beings. Right? Not only in terms of their neighbors, but even inside the home. Right? What human organization ever thought that every child should have their own room and no one should ever have to see each other inside the confines of a massive 4,000 square foot house? And then when you go out of that house, all you can see is, you know, thousands of miles of yard that you have to mow. Uh, and think of all of the massive architecture, both state and market, that's required to create the kind of commerce that we have now, the big box stores, all of the efforts at zoning, the mortgage market that helps to create and foster a suburbia in which you separate <laughs> commerce from where you live, a transportation system, right? first of all, financed by state and market alike, sometimes in partnership, but of course, backed up by force by our military and ensuring that we have ready access to cheap and plentiful oil. And the regulation regime that's supported by many of these big box stores that make them difficult ultimately to compete with. Right? It's not Walmart that's opposed to a lot of regulation. It's the competitors who want to get in and challenge Walmart. Right? Walmart is only happy to have its bevy of lawyers complying with all the various regulations. The irony of this creation of these free human beings is that we have arrived at this point now in which many people feel that we no longer control these tools that have made us free. And what we've seen in recent years is both sort of eruptions from both the left, particularly aimed at the market, and eruptions from the right, particularly aimed at the government, and yet, strikingly, I think they're both directed at the same source, which is the sense that we no longer control our destiny. And yet it's precisely in our condition of being free that we sense our powerlessness to these mechanisms that were supposed to be the tools of our liberation and yet which seem now to be out of our control, no longer subject to our command. Second, I want to suggest that one of the things that if you see, seek a society that seeks to put us back into the state of nature, into the freedom of the state of nature, you're likely to get the condition of the state of nature, which as Hobbes described it, is the war of all against all. What, what holds us together? What binds us as a society if we are all radically free and individuated? What happens to a sense of self-sacrifice, of patriotism, of, some, of, of uh, offering something uh, higher than yourself? One of the striking things that I've noticed, uh, Professor Allen was also at Princeton University. When I walked around the Princeton University campus when I was a younger professor there, every dorm room or nearly every dorm room had a star on the dorm room window, outside the window. Do you remember this, Professor Allen? This, this meant that somebody who lived in that room had lost their life in one of America's wars. I can't tell you exactly, but I think the percentage of students who go to Princeton now who serve in the military is well below 2%. It's highly unlikely that our ruling class is pursuing anything that we, th we, we would think of as a kind of a career dominated or oriented toward the common good. What holds us together with a declining ethos of self-sacrifice? And here, perhaps, the instructive figure is Thomas Hobbes' portrayal of what we need. And what we need is a leviathan. I don't know if you can see this well enough. It looks like he's wearing chain mail. But what he's actually wearing 
Uh, what actually composes them are all the little individual people who form the social contract. They're contained within the body of the state. The only thing that holds these individuals together is the power of the state, who themselves compose the state. They themselves make up the state. But what you, can, what you really can't see what's great is they're all looking up at the state and not at, not at each other. In our liberation, in some ways, we cease to see each other and rather understand our, ourselves solely as bound together within the power of the state. What tends to hold us together then, I think, as has been the case in our recent experience, is war. One of the, th the only times we come together is when we're at war. We feel, it, we're, we feel ourselves at war, and then we have these sort of momentary, uh, uh, obligatory uh, periods of two minutes of patriotism at baseball games and football games, and if you don't comply and kneel during the, the national anthem, you will, be, you will be shunned. But this is what holds us together now is the idea that we are in some ways held together by something outside of ourselves. And when the Cold War went away, things started to go really bad. Many people hope maybe it's the battle against Islam that will hold us together, but that didn't really work out. What binds us together? Society has begun in many ways to crack apart as that external force has declined. And the other thing that binds us together is our common belief that we're all getting richer. We'll all get wealthy as part of this mutual non-aggression pact. Life, liberty, and property. If everybody gets property, we'll all be better off. And one of the things we're discovering is that war and wealth might hold us together, but they can also tear us apart. And today, I think we're seeing that the concentration of wealth in our society is certainly tearing us apart. And this leads then to the third and my final suggestion of why liberalism has failed, is that the tools of liberation, the war of all against all, that in particular, the emphasis upon wealth, the pursuit of wealth, leads to the creation of a new aristocracy. I began this talk by saying that liberalism came into being to overturn the old aristocracy, to get rid of the de Tocquevilles, or at least the meaning of de Tocqueville, that your identity would be given to you as a matter of birthright. And yet, precisely because of the focus on increasing our liberty, especially through access to wealth, those who have the talent and the ability to live in an atomized, borderless, normless world these are the people that excel. Frankly, these are the people that get into our best schools. These are the people who are going to be successful in our world. And those who actually don't uh, thrive in an atomized, borderless, normless world are not doing well at all. If you follow some of the recent literature, Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, or the more recent book by Tim Carney called Alienated America, really worth reading, it describes how much this atomization of America is destroying, particularly, the life prospects of people who don't, don't enjoy the wealth and privilege of those who we call the, the economic winners, our meritocracy. But perhaps more ironically still, this meritocracy, or this new aristocracy, right, has actually perhaps as little merit as is argued often with the old aristocracy. And I think we saw that recently uh, with a certain scandal, which I think only highlighted that this was an illegal set of activities, the effort to bribe your way into elite universities, that was simply a kind of logical extension of what's done every day legally, completely legally, which is manipulating and gaming the system in order to perpetuate one's children's status in the aristocracy, the very reason that liberalism in some ways came into being to overturn, or at least one of the reasons, that we replaced one aristocracy with a new aristocracy. But to come back to de Tocqueville, where I'm again obligated and contractually uh, uh, must end, Tocqueville suggested that liberal democracy would in fact give rise to a new aristocracy, and it would be crueler, more likely to live at an extreme distance from, more likely to be indifferent to, and more likely uh, to separate itself from the plight of uh, those who were not members of the aristocracy. Now, that might be a romanticization of the old aristocracy, uh, but it's nevertheless the case that it seems that at least part of what we today understand uh, as the failure and certainly the crisis of, li of liberalism arises from a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots, between those who are likely to succeed not only economically, but in terms of social goods, uh, uh, soundness of family life and community life, and those for whom that will no longer be a possibility. So I want to suggest today that perhaps we've lived through two ages which were extremes. One which provided 
too little liberty. Right? As Tocqueville described, that's a slide that I skipped. Uh, an ar aristocracy binds people as if in a chain, links people to the past and to the future generations as if they're in a chain. And democracy shatters the chain and sets us all free, sets us free and apart from each other. Perhaps we've lived through two eras in which we've lived through the extremes. And as a good Aristotelian Thomist, I'm from Notre Dame after all, perhaps what we need is a mean. And that's where perhaps something may follow liberalism, something in which we can combine freedom with obligation and gratitude. And that would be my practical plan for which I will leave you to implement. So thank you so very much. Appreciate it. At this point, we move uh, from monologue to dialogue with a brief response by Professor Jesse Kaufman from Eastern uh, Michigan University. While uh, Jesse is presenting his uh, response, if you'd like to ask a question during the discussion period, uh, please take this opportunity to uh, line up at the mic. And uh, with that, I turn it over to, uh, to Jesse, and I'm gonna, uh, give that um, email list that I promised uh, before. And I should announce, by the way, there are books for sale over here at a, a discount uh, price, good free market uh, incentives. Uh, and get them while they're hot. Um, this is thanks to the bookstore, I believe, here, our own uh, local uh, branch of uh, Barnes & Noble, I think. Yeah, OK, uh, Jesse. Well, uh, thank you all for being here this evening. I'd also like to thank Gabe for inviting me here. He said he was uh, looking for someone to give a distinguished response, and I guess he couldn't find anyone, so he kindly allowed me to step in and do it. Um, it's really an honor to uh, share the platform for a few minutes with somebody I have admired greatly from a distance. Um, I think that we are all here, myself included, to listen to and engage with Professor Deneen, so I will keep these remarks very short. Gabe just asked me to give a few comments and then transition to discussion, so I'll do that. Now, my remarks are based mainly on his book, Why Liberalism Failed, um, because I wasn't entirely sure which elements he would uh, be highlighting in his talk tonight, and I, I read the book with a, a really powerful mix of uh, admiration and excitement and frustration and despair and irritation and sometimes anger, uh, often in the course of a single paragraph. It really is a remarkable book. Uh, uh, he's, he's done the remarkable trick of transcending the left-right divide in America and writing from a completely different perspective. And it works brilliantly. I live in a politically mixed marriage, and uh, my wife and I had lots of uh, interesting things to discuss and argue about in this book. Um, however, I think it's important, to, or not important, but perhaps helps to bear in mind that um, the book is, I think, much, much darker than the version you got of the talk tonight. Uh, it is darker, and it's also, it doesn't have the benefit of his obviously very genial and warm-hearted personality. So the book can be rather shocking, and my responses are more to the book. Just a long way of saying I will be talking about Nazis here in a minute, which, which you, you know, well, how did I get from this, who could argue with this, to Nazis? But um, bear with me, I think I can do it. So um, first, though, I want to just single out two things that I found deeply refreshing and compelling in his book. It was hard to limit myself to only two uh, because his book is it's so rich in ideas and it's so provocative in the best sense of the term. I could easily stand up here and sing a, a long canticle of praise. Um, but two things. One, I think his diagnosis of what we, we might call the, the wave of reactionary populism that has swept the West over the past 10 years is so insightful and so original. And for me, my and by training and profession, a historian of modern Germany, and if I, have to, if I had to read one more op-ed which said, yes, what's happening is we're reliving the 1930s and Hitler's waiting in the wings, um, often written by people who should know better. He is not interested in making that kind of argument. He, he tells us, and I think he's deeply right, that whatever crisis we're in is of our own time and of our own making. He locates it now. It's informed by history, of course, uh, but it is our crisis, not the crisis of some other time and place. Secondly, uh, 
to paraphrase one of my favorite insights from C.S. Lewis, he, he pointed out once how intoxicating it is to get worked up about the state of the world and to say, you know what the problem is? It's those people over there. And you know, if they would just get it together and you know, if they would just be moved out of the scene somehow, everything would be better. And what Lewis says is what, what I think Professor Deneen says. It's not that easy. The answer is in us. We are all complicit in this, and it is up to all of us to begin with ourselves. If you want to see some sort of change, it is up to you. Uh, it must begin with you. And that is something I also admired very much. Um, you know, we hear it all the time today, the problem, oh, it's illegal immigrants. No, it's the 1%. No, it's all the communist university faculty. No, it's Wall Street, right? No, it's, it's no easy answers like that, no easy villains. It's us. So uh, I thought that was fantastic. Nonetheless, I have a few reservations, also rooted in my work as a historian. Uh, the book made me a bit uneasy at points, not only because I saw some of my most cherished ideals rigorously and surgically dissected with analytical brilliance, but also because I would argue that among the pathologies of liberalism, and this is a phrase he uses a lot in his book, kind of self-destructive elements that liberalism itself creates, I would argue that historically, one of the most destructive pathologies that liberalism has generated is a search for a radical replacement that will remedy its supposed failures. And this search, which has been going on, I would argue, since the, say, early 1800s, this search for a radical replacement has produced results ranging from the mildly ineffective to the horrifically destructive. Ineffective like the various utopian communities founded in the 19th century and into a, the present day. Uh, places like Utopia, Ohio was founded by followers of an uh, early French socialist, uh, an anarchist named Charles Fourier, which is today a ghost town. Somewhat less benign, the anarchist terrorists of the late 19th century who believed that the liberal capitalist order was on the verge of collapse. It just needed a little help. And this movement produced the, the modern world's first terrorists, killed not only US presidents, but did things like bombed cafes in Paris and were summoned before the judge. The judge said, why did you kill these innocent people? And they would say, there's no such thing as an innocent bourgeois. They're deeply complicit in a horrific system. So they had to die. And then finally, the most destructive manifestations of communism and fascism, both of which are explicit, explicit rejections of the liberal order and of what communism dismissed as bourgeois individualism and Hitler as Jewish individualism. <clears throat> I'm obviously not lumping you in with these horrible people and these horrible movements, but I can't help but sense a certain family resemblance uh, between some of these criticisms and this longer trend of searches for a radical replacement for liberalism. Um, in, in other words, when it comes to liberalism's problems, the um, the cures have almost always been worse than the disease, or as the old German joke has it, the operation was a great success, although the patient died. So, um, And I think the resemblance is obscured by the fact, and if you read the book, you'll see this, this is a, a deeply American book in so many ways. For example, Professor Deneen talks a lot about agriculture and the importance of sort of natural connections and so on, uh, which leads him to think of these sort of genteel scholar farmers from Kentucky. It made me think instantly of Heinrich Himmler, uh, architect of the Holocaust, because uh, something not often noted in history class, he studied agriculture, and he knew exactly how to deal with an invasive species uh, and put that knowledge to work. So I can't help but feel queasy talking about organic connections and, and disruptions and so on. So. Secondly, also speaking as a historian, I think that liberalism, and in the book, it's, it's imminent demise is, is forecast. Uh, but I think liberalism has proven resilient in part because of its ability to generate a robust antibodies for its, sh its shortcomings, uh, from trade unions to mutual aid societies to charities. All of these have accompanied the rise of liberalism since it began to be translated from ideas into a set of practices um, and it continues to the present present day. I see it today in my role as um, a faculty advisor for the Catholic Student Organization on campus. It's a thriving organization, lots of members. Um, they voluntarily come together in this organization and yet do not have to separate themselves out from the wider Eastern Michigan community. And I think it is liberalism that allows us to do that and allows us to sustain that and allows other students to form their own organizations. And I think what illustrates the resilience of liberalism is comparison with a book with, that in some ways really reminded me of, of Professor Denise, which was Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. Um, 
because he also believed when he was writing in 1848 that he was, he was witnessing the inevitable destruction of, and collapse of the liberal capitalist order. Um, but in fact, he was only witnessing its birth pangs, and I think he did not see how resilient the, the antibodies could be. I thought maybe I was imagining this similarity, but your last paragraph talks about throwing off shackles, and Marx's last paragraph talks about throwing off chains. Is that just chance? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I have a, a list, a long list of questions, um, uh, but I, I will truncate it and, and finish up at dinner or something. So and, and turn the floor over. Uh, uh, one question. So for those who have not read the book, liberalism in, in his book moves like a river of acid through history, uh, dissolving all sorts of ancient institutions, social ties, longstanding traditions, and so on. And if that's true, then what chance does any potential remedy have? I mean, at, the, at the end, Professor Deneen proposes you know, small communities that nurture each other, but it seems that if liberalism is that powerful, it's going to find and destroy you before you have a chance to affect it. Secondly, I'm curious what you, what, you uh, what price you're willing to pay to see the kind of regeneration that you think is so important. Tightly knit communities can be wonderful. They can also be awful. There are you know, deep historical reasons why American banks can no longer be trusted to lend just to the community because that used to be a way of keeping people out. In other words, should we be allowed, should we be prepared to allow people to form communities that wish to exclude people on the basis of race? Should we allow Mormon fundamentalists to set up compounds where multiple child brides is the norm, and so on and so forth? Thirdly, I'm curious what role, if any, you think the state has to play. Fourthly, where will the values come from that reinvigorate this, uh, our culture? In his book, he talks a lot about the real meaning of freedom, which is the freedom to choose to do the right thing. Um, however, he also t locates these within societies that shared a very clear idea of what the right thing was. And it seems to me, um, I think even Eben Burke would agree with me that we simply don't live in that kind of world anymore. Fifthly, so again, speaking as a historian, um, I wonder if you could speak more at some point what you think the contours of our present crisis is. Um, it, it, his book is a wonderfully refreshing antidote to, the, you might have heard of this book by the Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker. The title is basically why everything's awesome and getting more, uh, more awesome every day. Um, but you know, he's got some good points. Um, in, in the word crisis, within my field of German history, is something people have been arguing about lately. What do we really mean by that? Um, I would say that Locke and Hobbes, I mean, they were writing at a time of real crisis, right? When these tightly knit communities were slaughtering each other by the hundreds of thousands in the wars of religion and the English Civil War. So um, are we in a crisis? I mean, there's a lot of unpleasant things going on, but maybe not. Oh, well, in any event, so I look forward to your questions and hearing, uh, hearing the dialogue. Thank you. And with that, we uh, turn it back to Professor Deneen, who will naturally respond to Professor Kaufman. Those of you with questions may uh, start to line up at the mic, or if you prefer to uh, wait, uh, question time should last until uh, about quarter uh, of, or just slightly more than that. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, thoughtful, sometimes complimentary, sometimes challenging uh, comments. Uh, I guess when you ask a professor of German history to respond, everything, it's like a hammer and a nail, everything looks like a German. So I'm two parts fascist and three parts Marx, so uh, take, your, take your pick. Uh, friends of mine on the left think I'm more fascist and friends of mine on the right think I'm, think I'm more Marx, so I suppose that reveals you since you suspect I conclude with, uh, with, with a Marxist conclusion. I'm not, I'm not sure what, uh, what what you suggested. I might uh, tackle one uh, one question, but maybe maybe I can speak a little bit to the darkness of the book, um, uh, and uh, um, maybe maybe for the purpose of speaking to uh, an audience that I knew would be mixed, uh, some undergraduates, some people from the community, some scholars, uh, to pitch it at a level um, 
that would you know allow you i hope to enter into the spirit of the book but not not uh, necessarily uh, hit you over the head with some of the despair that i think uh, i perhaps uh, express and part of the part of the, i think what is the despair in some ways is uh, is exactly what um what Jesse described as uh, the resilience of liberalism in many ways. Um, that in my, as I, as I began by suggesting, my, my thesis is that liberalism has failed because it has succeeded. And so in some ways, I sort of see a liberal world and a liberal future as far as the eye can see. I actually, I, I didn't conclude the book suggesting we would see the imminent demise of liberalism and its overthrow by fascism, although I think, as I begin the book by saying, it was written before the election of Donald Trump and Brexit and populist movements in uh, Eastern Europe and Europe uh, more broadly. So, um, you know, perhaps there is a, an historical analog that we need to think about. Um, so, I really, be, I really wrote the book in the belief that, um, you know, this kind of um, the, the the process of a kind of atomization of a deracination of the extending and expanding power of the, the market and the state to shape uh, our horizons uh, would more or less continue unobstructed. And in many ways, that's why I end the book on a, on a sort of almost a non-political note, which uh, was to suggest precisely that uh, maybe the best we can do right now is to in some ways intentionally and consciously shape lives that attempt to resist this logic in the in the ways that we can in our lives, in our families, our communities, um, and that's sort of evoking a little bit of the the thinker Wendell Berry, uh, who's the agrarian thinker that I think lies behind the not Himmler, uh, but uh, but but Berry, uh, who's very much worth reading. Um, I I actually um, I think uh, in many ways um, I'm in some ways more hopeful about politics in light of recent events, uh, elections and, and reactions to elections. I realize it's odd to say that because I think most of us sort of think we're in this you know, nascent civil war. Uh, we've had an election of a, of, of a president who you know, some portion of the country regards as uh, the best thing that could have happened and other portions of the country regard as uh, you know, uh, Satan incarnate. Uh, so to suggest that there's a hopeful aspect to this uh, political moment may seem odd. But what I do find hopeful is in many ways, one of the consequences of the election of Donald Trump, I think Brexit, I think what's happening in Europe more broadly, is that the liberal consensus in many ways has been shattered. Uh, and we have an opening today for ways of thinking about solidarity, of constraining both um, the fragmenting power of the state and the market that I think both parties are actually interested in. I mean, it's actually kind of fascinating that, you know, to have Tucker Carlson on Fox News give a, a monologue about the, uh, about the dangers of capitalism. I mean, who would have ever thought that Fox News would have a commentator uh, criticizing aspects of the free market? Um, you know, we have a mayor running from South Bend for president, Pete Buttigieg, uh, who's been eloquent about the need to repair the kinds of communities that those who have been successful in the merit meritocratic race uh, have largely overlooked. Uh, so I, in many ways, I'm actually heartened by this, this um, the, uh, the, the destruction of what I think had become a very uh, comfy liberal consensus. I, part of the reason I left D.C. is that it didn't matter if you were a liberal or conservative in D.C. Everybody was living exactly the same lives uh, of comfort. And uh, for those of you old enough to know the reference, basically living in Panem uh, from the Hunger Games, you know, the, the, the city that was absorbing all the goods and the people from everywhere in the country. I don't know if that's a, call, a, ref, a reference that any of you recognize, but uh, uh, but that uh, and in many ways uh, that uh, I think that that book described a kind of world that many people were experiencing, a, a world in which the children were not doing well, while those in the capital city were doing extremely well. So uh, while uh, while this is a, a politically fraught time, and there's no doubt about that, I also think it's a time in which there is um, there are inklings of ways in which uh, something fruitful could come of this wrenching political time. So I, I choose in odd ways, uh, in spite of the darkness of the conclusion of the book, to, to see potential out of this uh, time of um, instability and uncertainty in the hopes that um, uh, something, uh, some kind of, in a way, a new alignment might arise uh, that uh, uh, might, might work at rebuilding some of the frayed um, ties, relationships, and bonds of, of our nation. That's at least a hope. I'm not certainly not uh, optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Let me let me stop there and see if there's any uh, anybody that would like to 
ask anything on the talk or from the book or I would love it if you told me who you were and what you do. Uh, I'm Professor Tony Elman from the philosophy department here. Thank you. Uh, you, you started off the, the talk today uh, coming across as very nostalgic uh, from an era where uh, each of us don't just get to choose our own identities. Um, but where, where they're given to us in a way that we, we can't just easily walk away from them. Um, but it strikes me that there's some reasons why uh, we've moved away from that model. Um, and one of those reasons is that it, it has the result that we sometimes find ourselves with identities that uh, don't resonate with us inwardly, um, that don't reflect our own most deeply held beliefs, feelings, and desires. So, uh, when we're given our identities, instead of choosing them, sometimes we end up with identities that feel inauthentic or dishonest, as Rousseau talks about. Um, so my question is whether you think we can return to a model uh, where our identities are given uh, rather than chosen, um, but also do justice to our desire to have identities that seem, uh, that resonate with us inwardly. Um, what's the Aristotelian mean look like for you here? Great, and, and uh, just to be clear, I, I really began the talk um, in order to help, I think, situate what liberalism in many ways was attempting to do or the architects of liberalism were attempting to do and the context in which they were writing. And so I uh, actually, I, I don't think I was and certainly didn't intend uh, to suggest uh, or to sound nostalgic about this. It was really descriptive, uh, descriptive of, of the context in which a figure like, like Locke was writing. Um, uh, and in fact, I, I hope during the course of the talk, I acknowledge that uh, that uh, there was, uh, you know, acknowledging in part that uh, citation from Tocqueville that uh, you know or this kind of aristocratic ages in which I identity was given uh, constrained liberty too much. Um, and I think, in many ways, our challenge today it lies at the opposite. When you when you make the default choice, uh, and all forms of identity or choice. Identity in many ways becomes um, perhaps uh, so fluid to the point of being unstable. Uh, and that's, that seems to me to be the kind of opposite danger. I mean, now I'm going to start to sound like Freud or Eric Fromm, but maybe that's not the worst thing. Uh, that, um, and, and I want to think about it in particularly this way, that um, especially by thinking of ourselves as self-creating selves, and which I think is the, really the orientation and ultimate uh, telos of the liberal self, is to... Um, g often give ourselves more credit than we deserve in our self-making. And among other things, I think this has contributed to a certain strain on the political right, right? When, uh, um, uh, I forget who said it, but when, uh, um, when, oh, when President Obama said, uh, you didn't make that, right? This was an attempt to correct the view that everyone who has invented something, has created something, has built something, has stood on the shoulders of someone else. Right? Every human life is part of a longer narrative. It's part of a longer story. But when you live in a world in which you understand your identity as made and created and built solely by my own effort and the sum of my choices, that understanding becomes undermined. And if you perhaps remember in response to that statement by President Obama, um, you know, the elements of Fox News, uh, you know, use that for days, right? What he's saying is that you deserve no credit. Now, I think neither of these positions is, is, is wholly correct, right? Of course, we want to have the understanding that people are responsible for their lives, responsible for their choices. But we also want that to be, it seems to me, in the context in which we understand that we are indebted. We're indebted to others in ways uh, that we often don't, we can't be completely aware of. Uh, I think of this particularly in terms of generational indebtedness. One of the things I think, and I stress this in the book, I think in the effort to liberate us from the, the inheritance, the problem of inheritance, uh, a liberal regime and liberal selves, in a sense, go too far in, in the ideal of making the self. Uh, there's haunting passages in Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, a chapter on restlessness. He comes to America and he says, he writes, he's never seen a people so constantly in motion, driven by the fear and the anxiety that whatever choice they have made might in fact 
um, obscure from them a better choice that lies right around the corner. And he has this passage which he says, before they even finish putting a roof on their home, they're selling it uh, to, uh, to search for a new home. It almost describes like every show on HGTV, right? you know, flip that house and so forth. Um, in other words, what he's describing is a world of institutionalized discontent. Right? And I, I certainly see this among my students. I, I, I tell my students I, I actually feel sorry for them uh, that uh, when I was growing up, you know, the, um, the search for a mate, uh, for uh, a partner, a wife, a husband, was uh, you know, limited somewhat. Uh, we were transitioning from the limits of a, of a spouse in one's high school, which was you know, maybe 300 people, 400 people, if you were interested in the opposite sex, divide that in half. Uh, or if you went off to college, you know, you could, you, could, you could increase that by several orders of magnitude. So maybe your mate pool would, you know, would increase to several thousand. Uh, but that was it. Uh, you'd you'd want to get married before you got out of college because you know, then you weren't going to meet anybody anymore. And to think of what it must be like to be you know, looking through Tinder uh, and swiping to the left uh, because... You know, this person's almost perfect, but that eyebrow seems a little bit too dark. <laughs> Imagine a world in which it, you have infinite choice, right, of not only blue jeans and, you know, iPods and uh, earbuds and so forth, but the most significant relationships you're likely to have and how difficult it's going to be to choose, to settle on someone, knowing that there might be someone else out there who's actually better. Or if you do settle, that constant anxiety, oh, did I choose rightly? And uh, there might be someone better. Now again, this is not to say we should go back to an age in which you're bound and, and imprisoned in, in a relationship, but what it is to say is that I think uh, in many ways we have, we, we're, are, we're faced with the opposite program in ma problem in many ways, which is the uh, a world in which the default of freedom and self-making makes it difficult for us to have commitments and to feel a sense of bond and obligation to the past and to the future. And I say this especially in a room full of students, which, you know, if you're like students everywhere, you're living in a world in which, you know, the greatest gift you're going to get from the generation above you, ahead of you, is debt. Right? What, what civilization, what civilization ever sought to give its children less than nothing as their inheritance? It's a civilization that focuses upon itself and its time and its generation above that of the next generation. I think that's, that I would describe as at least something of a crisis. Hi, uh, my name is Uwe Aguirre. I'm a professor here in the economics department. Uh, Three thoughts, I don't know if they are, if they are questions, but uh, one is that, um, uh, well, what you, what you started talking, it, I could have used it for, to, to start my classes in economics at the, at the very beginning, uh, uh, this idea of choice. Yeah. But with choice also we teach scarcity and competition. That's something that you have not expressly mentioned, and I think that also influences what, how we organize ourselves, what we do. Sure. So that's something that I, I that was, that was implied in my discussion about at least mention of war against all, war of all against all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other point is uh, uh, the other point that I wanted to make is that um, w this about if this is a crisis or not. I mean, this it's hundreds years of change. So are we are, are we like you know living just this is just another bump in the road? I mean. Uh, in the early 20th century, a lot of people, a mass, massive number of people, thought that the Soviet Union was the greatest idea, you know. Or and, and Nazis, the, the Nazis has a lot of support. I mean, uh, 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 so uh, is this really a crisis? Is just part of the of this long process? If we look farther back, we can clearly see this evolution to, towards individualism and liberalism. Uh, uh, but certainly has gone up and down. So, uh, and finally, perhaps because I'm an economist, I, I want to defend a little of the market. I, I, I think that, that the, uh, you know, you, you put as, as 
the markets and the state at the set, at same level, uh, actually the tools that are, are, are actually uh, destroying liberalism. <coughs> and I would say that actually it's the state because if it, the, the market without the state will not, I mean, the rise of a new aristocracy will not be possible without the, the increasing power of the state. Mm -hmm. it, it's, the, it's the people that are in the market playing the g market game that start using the political game yeah, rent so, seeking. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. all the public choice uh, mm -hmm. uh, literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the yeah. comments. Yeah, I should I should mention that Deirdre McCloskey uh, savaged yeah. my book, so uh, <laughs> so I'm well aware of the view of the liberal economists about my uh, my position. Um, well, yeah, right. So I mean, go see. You know, I be, I think it's to the credit of the uh, of the center that it brings in people of really uh, diverse perspectives. Um, I, you know, I, of course, and I think uh, Jesse was suggesting the same thing, that uh, uh, is this not yet another of the, what have been many critiques, right? This is longstanding. You've had utopian movements seeking to correct uh, the excesses of individualism and atomization. You've had uh, arguments, communism, fascism, you gave us a whole list of these. Um, it, it, again, I think it's certainly um, is doubtless the case that, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, the United States is not ending imminently next week. Uh, you know, it might seem like it on some Mondays. Uh, and some Mondays, I actually think we are. Uh, but um, you know, what's striking about um, whatever current political uh, moment we're experiencing is that this is occurring at a remarkable time in which we were not faced by, at least at this point, by a kind of ex existential foreign threat I mean, you know, we talk about China as a, you know, potential threat, but we're still a very powerful nation. We're not, we're not facing the threat of communism that we faced in the mid middle part of the 20th century. We're not faced with the threat of fascism in the earlier part of the 20th century. We're at a time of fairly remarkable prosperity. Uh, you know, uh, even people who are not doing well in this country, many of them have cell phones and big screen TVs and automobiles. Uh, uh, this is not the grinding poverty of the Middle Ages. Um, in spite of the, um, obviously, the hue and cry over Donald Trump and, and our political situation, it, it's, it's not as if, you know, people are being rounded up in mass. I mean, you know, maybe you might say so on the borders, maybe some are, but there's, there's not, there's not, um, you know, we're not experiencing what, um, you know, here echoing some of the things that Jesse said, we're not experiencing the severe political dislocation that was experienced under communism and fascism. And yet, and yet, we are experiencing this kind of crisis of confidence in the regime. I mean, I, I'm hearing more people discuss a legitimation crisis in America uh, than I've certainly heard since uh, since the 1960s and earlier. So I, I don't mean to suggest that we're this is a this is a, uh, we're we're facing imminent demise and so forth. My analysis is really suggesting that we are seeing the fruits of the very success of this project, right? And in this, I'm really, uh, you know, here all great, well, all authors who aspire to greatness should simply more or less steal from other authors. Uh, and in this sense, I'm simply stealing from Alexis de Tocqueville, who at the end of Democracy in America said that every regime contains the seeds of its own self-destruction because every regime will go to an extreme in its own belief system, in arranging its own belief system. And there is no belief system that doesn't, in a sense, contain its own excess. Right? And this is true of a society that's too closed and doesn't allow any cho choice. And it's just as true in a society such as ours. What Tocqueville argued and what he urged was to attempt to retain or to create in new forms ways of life and living that could press against this internal tendency towards self-destruction. And I think we're at the moment in which every remedy that Tocqueville suggested, associational life, communal life, strong religious tradition, strong sense of memory, the role of lawyers in being forces of stability in our society, right? Imagine that. Every single one of his recommendations more or less has evaporated. We're in need of volume three of Democracy in America, which is held in the little case that says break in case of emergency. And yet he didn't write volume three. Volume three is what happens when everything I'm recommending has ceased to exist as a possibility 
of a corrective. So this is why, I, at least I think, that we're faced with this extraordinary challenge, whether it's existential and ultimately threatens uh, the future uh, prospects of liberalism in some form or another. We'll, we'll have to wait and see, but I do think it has touched a moment. I, I won't say much about uh, the liberal market uh, other than um, one of the things that strikes me about um, market uh, about a life under the liberal market is that it tends to be imperialistic. It tends to uh, redefine everything in terms of the market, and, and including places and aspects of life that shouldn't be redefined in terms of the market. And one place where I think that's the case, I'll, I'll give you an example very close to home, it's a university. Right? A university should be a place that's not driven or organized based upon the market. So your dean is here, I can say this. Uh, that, um, that market forces should be uh, put in their right place. And a university is a place in which, among other things, certain kinds of goods and values ought to predominate. Among other things, it should be places where you have a curriculum that's designed and shaped by a faculty with wisdom and prudence and a kind of uh, a form, <laughs> a form of, of communal understanding about what it is we're producing. Right? We're producing human beings. We're producing adult human beings. This is where laissez-faire ought not to work, right? Every one of you probably has a curriculum in which you get to choose whatever you want to fulfill your curriculum, more or less. It's a cafeteria. You know what cafeteria food is like. It's not really very good. And you pile up stuff. I mean, you've been in dining halls. You pile up all this food, and you realize, like, how did I put mashed potatoes next to chili next to, I mean, you know, you start to get in weird combinations. A curriculum is supposed to make sense, but it requires a kind of community that can't be laissez-faire. It requires a kind of an agreement about what is, what is the object and aim of our, of our community. What is the kind of human being we're attempting to cultivate and produce? Simply by being Adam Smithian uh, laborers and relying upon the invisible hand to create this next generation, it seems to me, is one place where the market ought not to predominate. And we could talk about other places where that's true. So the market has its place, but it also ought to be put in its place. Good evening. Uh, I like that last line there. Thanks. Uh, there was a talk in the response about the resilience of liberalism, and it seems to me that that resilience is most exemplified uh, when the, our country or society is united in some sort of common purpose, uh, whether that be in World War II against the Nazis or uh, during the Cold War against the Soviets. Uh, and that challenge to our system poses some sort of temp temporary remedy uh, you know, in the form of unity against an enemy, it, but obviously that's that's temporary. So my question was, do you think that there's a form of liberal government that we will see in the future that offers its society some sort of common purpose or commonality that look, allows them to look at each other, uh, you know, as common men and women, or do yeah. you think that's outside the scope of a liberal government? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Well, I, as I suggested, at least in one point of the talk, I think um, as we become more atomized and fragmented, various um, somewhat dubious ways in which we achieve a common purpose come to fill in that space. Um, and so war tends to play that purpose. Having an external enemy tends to play that purpose. Pursuing wealth uh, tends to play that purpose. Um, it's... Uh, I think you're right. I think one of the one of the real challenges today is that uh, it's very difficult to think of what any kind of common purpose would be. I was struck uh, in the uh, the most recent uh, State of the Union address by by President Trump that he spent a lot of that address evoking memories of World War II and the space uh, that the effort to go to the moon. Right, the people that he had, Gus Grissom and others, uh, evoked a time in American history where there seemed to be a kind of a common purpose. And yet it described an America that doesn't seem to be uh, on the ground today. It was this kind of effort to evoke a memory. Uh, I, when we think about the division that I think has especially developed not only in the United States but across the world, we're seeing a division, that, as, I, as I ended by describing, between those who are flourishing under this liberal regime and those are not. And I think this is the area where, frankly, uh, again, just to be a little close to home, this is where our universities should be spending a lot more of their time thinking about. We think a lot about diversity and inclusion using categories of race and gender and sexual orientation, and, and, and by no means would I gain say that those are important ways in which one should have diversity and inclusion. But I, need, I think we ought to need to be thinking a lot more about class and geography, about mixing people from different parts of the country. I think some form of a national service requirement, which would, would, would involve everyone, 
in, among other things, helping not simply military, but helping to rebuild the infrastructure of the United States, having people mixing from different experiences in different parts of the country, would be a valuable way for us to engage people who are no longer speaking to each other. I think we need to think creatively about bringing Americans together in ways we've begun to segregate ourselves, especially in a class divide. And frankly, our institutions, especially our elite institutions of higher education, as far as I can tell, have done little or nothing in thinking about this, I think, the source of one of our deepest political divides today. In fact, I think in many ways they are, let me put it this way, I think that the way in which diversity and inclusion is defined on campuses like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, et cetera, allows the self-congratulatory belief that we are all egalitarians here at Harvard. <laughs> While leaving outside of the realm of question and real probing how these institutions are complicit in advancing an economic and political system in which some people win and some people lose. And I think these, these institutions should be doing a lot more work. And frankly, if they're not going to do it, should be held accountable in their complicity in perpetuating this divide that they themselves uh, tend to bemoan politically but do very little intellectually to address. So that would be uh, step one, I think. Thank you for that great question. Sir. Hi. Um I was, or just tell me who you are. Oh, my name's Will. I'm a sophomore at NMU. Great. I was struck by a very particular part of your talk because um, it made me think uh, about merits to some things that I once dismissed as absurd. Now, particularly I was struck by the notion that, you know, the, in the institutions of state and market, that which make us free, are also... Uh, forces in our oppression, and that made me think that perhaps there is some merit to, like, an anarcho-primitivist standpoint of somebody mm -hmm. like Chris McCandless or Ted Kaczynski, bad example, but, you know, as somebody who believes that... He was a smart guy. Yeah. <laughs> somebody who Crazy, believes, but smart. Yeah. Somebody who believes that mm -hmm. abolition of the market and getting rid of the state altogether would truly make us free. Mm. And what I was wondering is, we understand that there are good, there, the state makes us free and the market makes us free, but also that they oppress us. And so is anarchy and is mm -hmm. primitivism the answer to being free without oppression? And if not, mm -hmm. what is your suggestion as to yeah. why um, I would say uh, it might be the answer for some people. Maybe you should go to Utopia, Ohio, uh, and give, can give that a try. Um, uh, I actually have a student right now who's writing a thesis. He's, uh, uh, I think you, you may want to meet him. Uh, he's uh, uh, looking to, to advance a theory of anarchism, uh, primitive anarchism, as, a, as the solution to our problem. Um, I, I'm actually not of the view that we'll eliminate the state and the market. Um, I think they both are fundamental to human life in some form or another. We need ways in which to coordinate our activities together. We, we need ways in which we exchange goods and services. And, uh, but I think there are different ways in which the state and the market can be formed uh, and form each other. Uh, and I, uh, frankly, I would give the place of pride to the state. It is the most common. It is that which we share. It is that which is brought into being uh, to help to shape the common good. And the, the aspiration of the common good ought to help shape the market. In this sense, I'm an Aristotelian Thomist. In Athens, ancient Athens, the market was inside the polis. And we live in a world in which the polis is inside the market, right? in which the market is global, in which we have uh, political entities that are within the market. And this is a reversal of what I think should be the case. Um, but that said, uh, I guess maybe, and maybe we might agree or we might disagree. Uh, as, as Jesse suggested, uh, I actually think the, maybe the, the fundamental error of liberalism is a false definition of liberty. That, uh, that under liberalism, and we, we saw that in John Locke's definition and even Tocqueville's suggestion of what the telos of liberalism is, liberty is seen as the absence of external constraints upon what I want to do. And this, is, this seems to me, if you shape a world in the image of that ideal of liberty, you are going to get people who are very bad at practicing liberty, right? They're going to, that are actually uh, uh, Ill, Ill prepared for freedom. That freedom, in fact, is, uh, I, I would resort here to the more classical tradition, the classical uh, 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 
ancient classical as well as the uh, Christian tradition that suggests that liberty is our studied and uh, um, in, in many ways self-disciplined ability to practice self-governance, right? You're free to eat those 14 bags of Doritos, right? But it's not good for you, right? Uh, one needs to learn the kind of discipline to maybe eat two of Doritos and then go work out for an hour afterwards. Uh, that liberty is the capacity to govern our appetites, right? As St. As Paul would argue, uh, liberty is only achieved when the lower and basis parts of your desires, right, and what he would describe as sin, are governed uh, by the elevated part of our desires, an argument you can find in Plato and Aristotle and so forth. So in this sense, I think that a society, uh, you know, we could say beginning with some form of, of, a, of a political and market orientation that at the very least doesn't seek to destroy or undermine this form or teaching about liberty is in the first aspect desirable. And then we need to think about shoring up and strengthening the aspects of society that are most responsible for teaching this form of liberty. And that's clearly the family, communities, churches, and schools. Right? And this, is, this is one argument uh, for the reinstitution of some forms of liberal education the liberal arts. What, is the, what are the liberal arts? It is the education in liberty. It is the art of being free. It's not something you're born with. It's not a, a status in the state of nature. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a discipline that's learned. Right? So in this sense, I think uh, maybe the most fundamental uh, corrective we need um, is a reconception of the understanding of what constitutes liberty and how best to achieve it. So anyway, thank you. I'd love to chat a little bit more about anarchism. Uh, interest of time, okay. if I may, yeah. could I ask each uh, person uh, in line to briefly state their question in turn, and then if Professor Dinian would conclude. Hello, my name is Alex Teodoro. I'm an undergraduate student here at NMU. So you said in your presentation that liberalism was founded on the values of becoming free from uh, an identity that you're stuck in, or a community or identity that you cannot leave. And of course, that's led to what you've shown, a decrease in happiness or friendships or all these different things. And you said as a solution to said problems, the solution you stated was that you need more community obligation or a community of obligation. But isn't that reminiscent of a previous time before liberalism? And that was the reason of liberalism coming into itself Thank you. Thank you. Each, please uh, state your question briefly, and we'll have a concluding overall answer. So, Dr. Neen, my name is James Tridmore. I'm a senior here. Uh, in your book, and unfortunately for the people in the room, I'm going to quote from your book, you mentioned the genie of globalism. Now, the jinn in Middle Eastern philosophy is an evil figure. You mentioned small communities at the end of your book. All right. How do those small communities avoid the, if we are going to ascribe the uh, evil qualities of the jinn to liberalism, the evils of liberalism, fascism, and Marxism? That's a question. Um, I'd just like to say that I was really interested in some of the comments about iPods, blue jeans, and <laughs> the impoverished having access to iPhones and flat screen televisions. Mm. It reminded me of how we have what I think is an increased commodification of the individual, how millennials and Gen Z individuals define themselves more and more with avocado toast and Carhartt clothing um, amidst this lack of ability to pay off debilitating student debt and the abysmal uh, prospects of me ever owning a house or starting a family, you know, just things I think about at night. Um, and I was wondering how these were symptomatic of um, liberalism and late stage liberalism that we live in. Right. Thank you. Well, who are you? <laughs> oh, well, I'm Sam. I am a freshman here at NMU. Okay, thank That's you. That's about it. Great thank question. You. So, you know me, Patrick. <coughs> All right. Um, Troublemaker. <laughs> yes, maybe. Um, so, <coughs> I guess um, I thought your litany of complaints, right, about <coughs> modern society, uh, alienation in the political world, right, and <coughs> economic inequalities, environmental disasters, and so on. <coughs> uh, I have plenty, there's plenty there that I can agree with, 
Right. Um, I was disturbed, right, by your attribution, right, of all of these problems, right, to a single source, uh, <coughs> that is liberalism, and I could really not recognize, right, the thinkers that I associate with the <coughs> political tradition of liberalism in the descriptions that you gave of them, right, as if all they had to say about liberty is <coughs> that liberty is the freedom to choose to do whatever we want as if none of them ever spoke about the constraints of the natural law, right, or concern for the common good. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess the worry that I have, right, and I think the problem that that caricature creates for your argument is it leaves you with a problem to explain how it is that liberalism, as you describe it, ever got off the ground in the first place, right? Clearer in your book, right, than in your presentation is the thought that the liberal conception of liberty that you outlined is not a valid conception of liberty at all. It's not that we've got too much liberty, right? We really don't have liberty at all, right? <coughs> um, uh, so then what is it, right, that made this project attractive in the first place, right? <coughs> it won't do, right, to say that, well, our base desires, right, are always very strong, right, and <clears throat> we gave in to that temptation, because then you would expect to find earlier attempts, right, maybe successfully countered uh, <clears throat> by notions of ancient notions of liberty or traditional conceptions of authority in good order. But I think this raises the suspicion, right, that they were not in good order, right, and that liberalism was responding right, to that disorder, uh, and that you may be guilty of throwing babies out with the bathwater. <clears throat> Hello? Here. Is that good? I don't know. I can't tell. Anyway, um, my name is Matt Fahey. I am a freshman here at NMU, a political science major, uh, and I just wanted, uh, you touched a little bit on your uh, talk today about uh, how uh, we have seen a liberty from uh, aspects like uh, marriage and uh, friends and children. Um, and I'd just like you to briefly touch on how those exactly connect back to liberalism because in the sense of our current system socially and economically, we see a far pull to uh, career-oriented um, livelihoods and a great example would be Japan for example where uh, they have uh, low lowering uh, sorry descending birth rates and uh, lower marriages because they concentrate on their careers uh, how's that a fault of liberalism um, in the sense of i at least from my perspective seems to be that critics of liberalism seem to uh, more fall in line with um, the idea those ideas so Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Kangas. I, uh, I don't want to sound apocalyptic or anything, but uh, <laughs> the works of Plato, he, in the Republic, he talks about how the he creates an example of a degradation of a society, and in uh, Frederick Nietzsche's uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he talks about the last man, how the relationship between his idea of what a good society being a person and what a bad society, being a bad person, both of them end in being bad things. The Atlantean society destroys themselves, and the last man is so content with his life that he doesn't ever think for himself or doesn't ever struggle. For you, what do you feel is the ultimate conclusion or the ultimate fallout of if liberalism just keeps going forever? Thank you. Thank you. Howdy. I'm DeForest. I'm not so much a student at NMU as I am a thorn in the side of NMU. <laughs> but my question, if it was boiled down, would be something like, it seems to me that only in a liberal society, you know, with liberal principles, do you find a, a tolerance for like all the alternative societies that you're talking about, the Amish, the Utopia. Uh, you can just go on and on about all the stuff we tolerate. And I guess I'm not understanding your comments about the disconnect or the incompatibility between alternative societies and a liberal principle kind of a mindset. See how you're a thorn. <laughs> Thank you. So first of all, let me, uh, 
let me say what a remarkable thing it is uh, that you have this community here in which uh, this large audience has stayed until almost nine o'clock, uh, which I can see, you know, some, some, are, some are ditching now. No, but it's, uh, I think it's a real testimony uh, to, uh, uh, to this place that I've just dropped into, and I, I, I'm really privileged uh, to be with you that you would, I think our, at Notre Dame we would never get a, a room of people to, to hang out for two hours to listen to some, some person denouncing the evils of liberalism uh, unless they had to take my class. So, uh, so kudos and thanks very much uh, for this. Uh, it's difficult for me to answer all these questions, but I will do so in the next two hours. Uh, I guess let me, let me uh, let me just uh, broadly maybe summarize and conclude with just a few reflections that some of these questions have, uh, have uh, put to mind. Um, I think what lies behind a number of questions is the problem of going back. I think that was the first question, do we, do we want to go back? And, I, and I, in fact, I conclude my book by suggesting uh, that I very much fervently want to um, deny and reject the idea that there is any going back. I'm, I'm a Heracliton in the sense that you can never step into the same river twice. And it's, a, it's an indication, even the historian who said, what's refreshing about this book is that it doesn't seek to sort of blame and, and sort of re revive some historical moment that will help us understand this moment uh, that then he proceeded to describe. This sounds a lot like communism and fascism and uh, Marx and, well, uh, there was a little bit of that. Uh, I, we're in our own moment. And one of, the, one of the facts on the ground is that we're in a moment in which we've experienced liberalism. And that's, that's something that you can't leave behind or forget. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think it was correcting in here, um, you know, Jonathan and the first question are addressing this, which is uh, it was correcting something that was wrong in an earlier age. But simply to say if we correct what's wrong in our age means that we're going back to that old thing, it seems to me is to lack the courage that the liberals had in correcting the problems of their time. It's to act in the worst conservative sense, if I can say that. Liberals are the worst conservatives today. Right? Because often they will defend liberalism by saying, it's all we have, and if we, if we depart from it or argue for ways in which we depart from it, we'll go back to something even worse. What I want to argue is that in some ways you can't forget what we've had. Can you in some ways combine that which we know to have benefited from, certain forms of prosperity, right? without, uh, that was the, the question of the, uh, sorry, Sam, I think, uh, without forcing our young people into this terrible situation in which if they want to buy a home and start a family, they can't do so because we've saddled them with this incredible debt. Can we create a society in which we can have um, many of the benefits that we've experienced under liberalism without, it seems to me, the punishing and often um, you know, uh, life-destroying um, implications that it has for those who are not members of the aristocracy, uh, sorry, the meritocracy today. Um, I think uh, Professor Allen's question, um, and Mary, it asks, uh, how could it have gotten off the ground if it weren't addressing something real? And, and nothing in what I've said, and I hope nothing in what i said, isn't suggesting that it was addressing something real. But perhaps in addressing it so well, it confronts us with a new challenge. And in many ways, calls on us to have the kind of philosophical courage. And also, the courage to live in a way uh, distinct from uh, and conscious of the way in which this, we've been formed in this fishbowl. This is in some ways what I would say is the, one of the hallmarks of a society of choice, and I end the book on this note. In some ways, to live in distinction from liberalism is to be more fully free than a liberal is today. It's to live with a consciousness of the way in which you've been shaped, in which, the way in which this fishbowl water has been uh, formed. It's to live in the consciousness that if you default to this way, you are, in a sense, not living sufficiently conscious of the way in which you've been formed. The paradox in which a society formed and based on a conception of choice gives you a choice about everything except the choice of living in such a society. So in an interesting way, one of the ways in which we can't go back 
is a society in which your identity is given, in which it's inherited from your parents, it's inherited from where you happen to be born. But you can live in such a way in which your relationship to earlier generations and future generations is lived more fully than what is typically the case in a liberal society, in which your care for places is ground in a real experience of those places, in which your care for the nat natural world derives from your experience of the natural world and not some from theoretical understanding of the natural world. So I, I would simply say that we have to conceive of a way of freedom that occurs after liberalism without forgetting liberalism. And I think that's where a kind of true freedom lies. Uh, at least I would invite you to think about the ways in which you've been shaped and formed in ways you aren't even aware of. And that's the beginnings of the philosophical quest that is ultimately the truest form of freedom. Thank you so much for coming out here tonight. I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks uh, again to Jesse Kaufman, and again, thank you all uh, for being here, and uh, thanks to Patrick J. Uh, Deneen. See you next time. There's water and lemonade and coffee and tea and cookies. If you didn't know, take the cookies back to the dorms. There's fruit available outside here in the hall. Thank you, sir.